welcome to our second webinar for the year called, called Growth Stocks About to Sprout. My name is Shepard Gunera. I'm your host for today. There will be a few uh, stocks mentioned in today's webinar. Now, any number of companies named since during this webinar, it is important to understand that it is not any recommendation of any sort. None of our presenters today understand your personal financial situation. So therefore, they are not in a position to make any recommendations. It is also important that you seek and take professional advice before engaging in any security transactions. So please note that the views expressed by our presenters today do not necessarily reflect the views of Scaffold. Our first presenter today is uh, none other than Scaffold's general manager, uh, Chris Bachelor. Now, Chris will talk about investment trends and growth stocks. And we also have Roger Montgomery, who's the CIO of Montgomery Management Funds. And he's also he will talk about attributes of growth stocks and upcoming trends as well. And uh, I want to start off with you, Chris. Just give us a market overview. We've had of uh, there's been a mining boom. We've gone through a housing or market boom, a housing market boom, which is debatable and still in discussion. But uh, how have these trends been? Where we started off and where are we going? Yeah, sure, Shepard. So what I thought I might do is talk a bit about some of the trends we've seen in the past and then maybe pass over to my esteemed colleague, Roger, to talk about some of the things that might happen in the future. So I thought I'd start with the, the dot-com boom. Now, in my investing career, that's been the, the biggest uh, bubble, if you like, that, that we've seen in, in the time I've been in the markets. Um, there've always been booms and busts, and, and there always will be. They're a feature of the investment markets. Riding booms can be lots of fun, can also be very profitable. But if you jump on board too late or you fail to get out in time, it can be disastrous for your wealth. So looking at previous booms, it's a good idea to try and understand why did they come to an end. Now, the dot-com boom happened around the turn of the century. And you can see here, this is the NASDAQ Composite Index. The NASDAQ hit an all-time peak of 5,409 on the 10th of March in 2000. At that time, the euphoria in the market was really palpable. And anything that sounded even remotely techy or web-based was in hot demand. Chris, I can remember lose, I was working at Merrill Lynch at the time, and I can remember losing clients to my colleagues who were putting their clients into these stocks uh, and I refused to, and so lost a lot of clients. Yeah, it was it was one of those times when a lot of people were seen to be old school because mm, they wouldn't jump me. on board. Yeah. And uh, I, I know um, Kerr Nielsen from Platinum, he was in that same boat, but uh, time proved people like yourself right. <laughs> in fact, um, can I just chime in just very quickly? The first day listing in 1999, the first day listing premium on the NASDAQ for a stock was 90%, 90%. That was the first day. And I gave a seminar to the Australian Stock Exchange in 1999. There were people seated on the floor in front of the stage. They were standing in the aisles. And I remember asking the audience a question, who would be happy with a 20% return on their money this year? No one put their hand up. It wasn't enough. Yeah, well, on that point, in just the final two months of the boom, that the NASDAQ went from 4,000 to to its peak of 5,400, which was a 35% gain in two months. Mm. That's the sort of numbers people were thinking about. But of course, what then happened was that it all came crashing down and by October 2002, the index had fallen all the way back to 1,114, which is a 79% drop. Now talking, Roger, about that IPO euphoria, mm. I've got this chart here which shows some of the, the highest gains in IPOs that occurred during, during the boom. And the one at the top there is a, a company called VA Linux Systems, and, and they were sort of considered to be arguably the best performing IPO ever when they went up 700 the open source on a, the on open the first source day, yeah. uh, code. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know people were becoming founders, were becoming paper millionaires and billionaires overnight. But this particular company, it's, it's worth just having a, a look at. Uh, they changed their name to GeekNet. And you can see what happened. They peaked their valuation at about $14 billion and then went screaming down at a very <laughs> rapid rate of knots. Now, they did actually manage to generate a profitable business and, and stayed in business and 
just last year were bought out by a company called GameStop for $99 million. But when you compare that to the $14 billion valuation, it's, it's a, just a different Incredible kettle stuff. of fish. So what I wanted to talk about now is some of, some of the more sane companies of the time, like Microsoft and Cisco. If you'd bought those stocks back then, you, you know, you're looking at Incredibles PE ratios. Now, so why did it all come to an end? Well, to put it bluntly, investors woke up. Valuations had become completely detached from reality. The NASDAQ trailing PE ratio was 72. And, it, you know, it wasn't just the, the crazy little startups. It was these established businesses. For example, if you'd bought Microsoft at, at that valuation, 57 PE, and you'd held it right through until today, you'd be looking at you'd have earned back about half of your initial outlay. Mm. So you're looking at another 10 to 15 years just to earn back the money that you paid out, and that's before you start generating any sort of return. Cisco um, takes it even further. Cisco, you know, good, solid business, profitable then, profitable today. You'd have earned back about a third of your outlay by now, so this is, what, 16 years later, and who knows how long it'll take to actually get back to square one. You know, when when you're looking at businesses, it's, it does come down to valuation, and, and there's sort of three components, if you like, to valuation. One is what we know, and that's the historical results. Another is what we're fairly confident about, and that's your short-term forecast. And then there's always a speculative element for potential long-term growth. It's just that at some point in time, companies do have to earn enough earnings to justify those valuations, and when the valuations get to ridiculous levels, well, it just becomes increasingly unlikely that they're going to. Um, John Kenneth Galbraith, Chris, wrote a book called The Great Crash, uh, and it was written many, many decades ago. Uh, and he said you can identify a boom fairly easily simply by simply by noticing when people have thrown all aspects of asset ownership out the window. So enjoyment of a property, for example, the future income from that property, uh, you know, any aspect related to the fundamental reason that you might own it, um, if that's thrown out the window and replaced simply with the hope that it's going to go up next week and last month, next month, like it did last week and last month, you know you're in a bubble. And I think we've seen that, and we're going to talk about that later on. We've seen that in some aspects today. Yeah, exactly. So why don't we just move quickly on to the mining boom. Um, won't spend too much time on this, but basically the mining boom came to an end primarily as a result of supply and demand economics. So demand started to falter just at the time that supply was increasing. Mining follows commodity prices, and it's one of the more pure examples of market forces in play. Now, as demand for a commodity, say iron ore, um, increases, prices rise. And as prices rise, it becomes more attractive to invest in more mines, better equipment, etc. And over time, supply expands. Supply expands, price declines, all very normal. Problem arises when people forget that it's normal. And they think that somehow this time it's going to be different and that the prices will remain high forever. And it becomes a valuation issue when people base their valuations on those the assumption that those prices will remain high indefinitely, because as we all know, they won't. Lastly, I'll just touch on the property boom. Right now, we're in the midst of a property boom, and many commentators believe that it may actually be a bubble. If it is, it hasn't popped yet. But things to keep an eye on, uh, demand and supply, of course, credit growth, rental yields, We'll talk a little bit more about that as we progress. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, I know Roger's uh, written about property in a few of his blogs in the past few months, but Roger, let, let's just move it along here. We, we've talked about uh, trends that have just come, or you know, that are whether we're debating that are emerging. Or, 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 yep, yep, yep. So where are we going moving forward, and, and what sure. are, what do we have to look for? Okay. Um, well, you know, one of the one of the overwhelming, and, and it's probably no surprise to anyone. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. By the way, um, probably the most obvious trend and one that's undeniable is the aging uh, population. And it's not just an Australian experience. We're seeing it all around the world. This particular chart on the left hand side shows that the number of people over the age of sixty five will triple uh, in the next uh, thirty nine years. Uh, and that will have a phenomenal impact 
on every aspect of life in Australia, particularly because um, we have a relatively small population. Um, so, so what we're going to find is not only uh, not only is our population going to increase, but it's going to get older. And that has implications for lots of different businesses, one of which, of course, is financial services. You can see over on the right-hand side here, the amount of money in the superannuation system uh, yeah. is growing. Uh, and this is trillions of dollars. So, you know, but 2000, I guess, $2 trillion in 2015, and 10 years later, doubling to $4 trillion. That has implications not only for financial services businesses, for example, fund managers who are the recipients of those inflows, companies like BT and Henderson, um, Magellan and um, Platinum, uh, but also providers of lifetime annuities. And we've seen with the financial system inquiry, David Murray suggested um, that uh, lifetime annuity should be mandated as a proportion of people's superannuation. So business like Challenger is going to benefit um, from that. Um, but what's important to also note is it's not only beneficial for businesses, it's going to have implications for legislation. I believe, and I've written about this um, vociferously, uh, you know, I've, I've said um, in, in no, uh, you know, I've gotten absolutely no doubt um, that legislation will move towards the government accessing this pool of money simply mm -hmm. because they have managed the deficit, they manage their budget so poorly um, they will change legislation so that there's more money that stays in super and eventually they'll lean towards tapping it. Um, the Queensland government is already talking about it uh, and it won't surprise me if the federal government eventually does that as well. Remember, superannuation was invented by baby boomers for baby boomers. Um, and so once they've benefited from that superannuation, uh, it's likely that legislation will change such that we'll have to work longer before we can access it. We won't be able to access as much of it. And when we do access it, it'll be taxed. There'll be various ways and tools that the government will use to make sure that they get their share of this very large pile of money that isn't theirs. Um, so implications, of course, for financial services firms and the ageing um, baby boomers uh, also has implications for healthcare uh, businesses in Australia. But be careful about jumping on the bandwagon um, of, of um, hospital uh, hospitals because one, they're very expensive. Yes, they will do very well, but they can be very expensive. Um, so just be mindful of that. This is not a trend that we've discovered just now. Everyone's onto it. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And then aged care providers, you've got to be very careful there because yes, there's enormous growth, um, but the number of beds that you're allowed to have uh, is limited and legislated, and what you can charge per beds is also legislated. So the growth is limited there, even though there's there's fantastic demand. And I guess, Roger, that's an interesting point that you, you raise is that if a trend is really well known and, and um, you know, everyone's aware that it's happening, then it's often going to already be priced into equity. Oh, indeed, indeed, and that's why I mean that's what's that's what's so good about scaffold. It's a tool to enable you to at least estimate what a rational valuation for that business might be. You can choose to pay more than that if you want to, um, but at least you've got a good guide for yeah, you benchmark. know exactly for a going concern business might be worth. Um, look, there, the, the big one I'd like to talk about today, though, is this is this disruption, which really is, Chris uh, and Shep, it's just a fancy word for change. Okay. Uh, you know, remember, um, the blacksmith was disrupted by the invention of the car uh, and, 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 you know, arguably, arguably many, many uh, businesses were disrupted by the advent of the television and the wireless radio and the advent of commercial air, like air travel. Um, so, so you know, this is not nothing new, what we're about to talk about. Um, but I might talk about some that are less obvious. Uh, you know, a lot of people believe that the invention of video games um, would leave physical board games obsolete. Uh, and in fact, what's happened between 2010 and 2014 is board games have increased by 25 to 40% per annum. So, so maybe what's going on there is that is that people have said, you know what, no one talks during a video game, let's get together as a family. Or the parents can't yeah. play the video game successfully uh, and so they want to bring their kids back to board games. So we think that, you know, we often have these sort of beliefs that we can successfully predict what will be disrupted and in actual fact the reverse might be true. Another one is uh, is comic books. Yeah. Um, uh, 
The top 300 comic book titles actually sold 85 million print units in 2013, which was the highest total since 2007, according to Business Insider. So, you know, you would think that um, movies and everyone focusing on iPads and so forth, they're not going to buy comic books. But in actual fact, what's happened is the DC comic franchise uh, and the Marvel comic franchise, um, you know, which is now in the movies and in the cinemas, um, has actually brought people back to the original comics. Um, and that brings me to theatre audiences and box office sales. Um, theatre audiences were supposed to be uh, dwindling um, and people were supposed to be seduced away from multiplexes and art house cinemas by mobile phones and laptops and, and home home cinemas and, and, and high definition plasma tellies. And as those tally, tally televisions headed towards 100 inches, there's really apparently no need to go to the movies anymore. But in actual fact, in 2015, uh, movie attendance was up, Bo box office grosses were way up. And in fact, the summer of 2015 in the Northern Hemisphere was the second richest in raw dollar terms. Um, and in fact, since 2009, so talking about the last seven years, total annual ticket sales have stayed steady in the 10 to $11 billion range. Um, so there's been no detrimental impact um, from what we all predicted would be dis did the disrupting influences of personal viewing. Um, now, there is a counterpoint uh, to, to this. Uh, and, um, and of course, there are businesses that are being disrupted. Uh, and according to AdAge, um, the number of the newspaper projections um, suggest that print sales uh, are now going to drop and are going to continue dropping and they've dropped at a precipitous rate already, but they're going to drop by about 9% per annum. Remember that compounds? Yeah. So in nominal terms, it has a bigger impact on what remains, but they're going to compound at about 9% per annum through to at least 2019. And, and some believe that it will, it will reach a steady state at that point. I'm less sanguine and I actually <laughs> think that uh, I actually think it's going to continue to fragment uh, and what will emerge is some new business uh, which will aggregate your favourite news. So you won't have to go to, for example, The Age or the Sydney Morning Herald or one of the other national papers to find your, the stories that you like. You won't be relying on one masthead for your news. You'll subscribe to a service that aggregates the things you want to follow. Uh, and that will be the emergence of a new newspaper, if you like. Um, and that's the new news. Now, what's my conclusion on disruption? What I've observed is that digital disrupts analog when timeliness is an important factor. So if you want the latest thing, you want to know what the latest thing that Kim Kardashian is, is doing, you're not going to buy a magazine waiting to see what happens there you're going to actually want to subscribe to something online so that you're up with the latest. So where timeliness is, is of the essence, that's where digital is going to disrupt uh, disrupt um, uh, traditional businesses. Um, another trend uh, that's emerged is what's being dubbed uh, the gig economy. So this is where uh, you're doing something short term and you're collecting jobs where people need that particular service. So Airbnb, for example, um, Airbnb now has more hotel rooms or more rooms uh, than any hotel chain in the world and it doesn't own a single hotel. What's happened is the owners of property are happy to gig their property. You know, they're happy to rent it out, not for an entire year, but for short stay. And in fact, in Sydney, the suburb with the highest number of Airbnb rooms and entire houses mm -hmm. is Tamarama um, on the, uh, on the, in the okay. eastern, on the eastern, beaches, eastern yeah. beaches, eastern suburbs. Um, so, so that's an example of, of gig, the gig economy. Another one that, it, that, uh, that you might not have heard of is Expert 360. Uh, and that's where, um, uh, management consultants who have previously worked for Maricon or BCG or, or McKinsey, for example, have decided to go on freelance and they're offering their services for short term jobs. Uh, look, that's a business. That's a service that I think I'll be using in my business. Um, Expert 360. If I've got a task that I want completed, I might approach Expert 360. I'll get a better 
price than I would if I approached BCG or McKinsey, but I'll get a BCG or McKinsey uh, analyst coming to work for me. Freelancer is another example of that. If you're looking to develop a website or you're looking to design a brand um, there are, or, or program uh, something, uh, an app, for example, you can pitch your job on Freelancer and you'll be surprised at how cheaply that's offered now. So these businesses, and I won't go through all of them, they're disrupting traditional business models. They're disrupting the, the old employer-employee relationship. And this is a trend that's not going to go away. But here's the thing. Don't believe, and it's a big mistake in investing, people believe that you'll make a lot of money investing in these businesses. Sometimes there's no winner in business. Sometimes the winner is the consumer and not a business. Now, we think it's easier probably to pick the losers than it is, and I showed you even that's sometimes challenging with the comic books and the board games, for example, but it's probably easier to pick the losers than it is to pick the winners, remembering that sometimes the consumer wins overall. Remember, um, a lot of these businesses don't charge for their service. You know, it's free, uh, and as a result, they don't necessarily make a lot of money. Their share prices go up a lot because they've got a lot of eyeballs, uh, in, and, and back in the... Uh, you talked earlier about the internet boom in, in the at the turn of the century. You know there were new metrics that were designed to justify the prices That's of right. some of these stocks. Price per click. Yeah, it was price <laughs> per click or price per view or price per audience, um, and and none of that is actually matters. So the price might go up for these things, but if ultimately they don't make money, um, it's going to be a problem. Um, the final, uh, the final uh, thing, two trends that I want to talk about, in addition to the gig economy, is big data, um, both consumer uh, business to consumer businesses and and business to business businesses. Um, they're you know they're using data more and more now uh, to to analyze their customers and pitch their services to customers. But I think an interesting fact in big data is that of the Fortune 500 companies, according to Forbes, only 15% are currently using big data analytics. And so that's projected to grow a lot between now and 2020. And the final one is social selling. Mm -hmm. And that's where you know the traditional model of selling a product, um, maybe people don't care about that as much anymore. They're now looking to see what Chris you're buying and ship what you're buying. Yeah. If you're using um, uh, Facebook, for example, and you're promoting something that you just bought that you really love, I'm going to be more inclined to buy it if I like you and know you and you've just bought that product. So that genuine original content um, is going to be more valuable for brands than just marketing through advertising and the traditional method of, of promoting your product. So that's so there's another two, big data uh, is a big trend and social selling is another big trend that we're keeping an eye on. Roger, while we're at it, why don't we just duck back to property for a minute? What are your thoughts there, just in a nutshell? Yeah, look, very, very quickly, there's no doubt that we are currently constructing property at 50% more than demand requires using the ABS statistics for demand, and I'm using household formation as a proxy. Um, we need about 150,000 dwellings a year in Australia, and we're currently producing in the order of 230,000 a year. It doesn't matter whether you're looking at approval data or construction data or completion data, we are producing way more than what we need. And ground zero is this chart here. This is looking at um, particularly at units and apartment construction. And what we see there, just looking at the combined capitals number in the left-hand column, the total number of apartments, new and old, sold last year was 96,195. The total number of off the plan purchased apartments due to settle this year yeah. is almost the same number. That's just new off the plan. That's just telling you that there's a lot. Now, how have they been financed? They haven't been financed yet. They haven't been they haven't settled yet. A deposit has been paid, but a large number of buyers were Chinese buyers who got their deposit out two years ago when China was allowing the free outflow of capital, they've now cracked down on that. You can't take out more than 50,000. So how are you going to get the rest of your money out of China in order to settle? You think you might be able to borrow, but what's happened is the banks have all cracked down on lending to foreign purchases. So that's going to be a problem. A proportion of these settlements will fail. 
For domestic investors, what's happening now is the banks have low have raised their LVRs, so um, sorry, lowered the LVRs, so they're not lending as much. Uh, on a property is what they were willing to lend before. Uh, and also they're revaluing the properties upon settlement and they're revaluing them down. So again, a proportion of domestic investors in apartments will fail, they won't settle. And remember this number here, 92,102, just represents what was pre-sold. Property developers start construction when they're pre-sold maybe 70% or 80%. So there could be another 20 or 30% of this number that's coming onto the market that didn't even pre-sell. So that suggests big oversupply. Property developers will need to discount their properties or offer all sorts of incentives. For example, 10 year rental guarantees, which is the same at 2%, that's the same as a 20% reduction in the price of the property. They're gonna try and move these properties because they owe money to the banks. And if they don't pay the bank back, the bank lent them money for the development. If they don't pay the money back, the banks will take possession and they will discount the properties. And so what will happen is apartment prices will fall, perhaps by 20 or 30 percent. Um, and that will be because the developers are discounting the property prices. And then what will happen is buyers will say, well, you know what, I can get an apartment cheaper than a house. Why would I go to the auction for the house? And that means less buyers for a house. Now they're not completely transferable houses and apartments, yeah. but there will be fewer people attending auctions for houses unless the sellers of houses discount their prices as well. And then the whole property market comes off somewhat. That's the thesis. So right. you reckon property is not immune to demand and supply economics? No, nothing ever is. <laughs> nothing ever is, Chris. All right, gentlemen. Look, I'll, 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 hold, I'll hold it down a little bit. Uh, so we've, we've talked about the overall view on trends. We've talked about you know where we're going, where we've been. I, I would like to bring it down to the nuts and bolts of investing. Now, Roger, I want us to talk about the attributes you look for in growth stocks. And Chris, if, if, if you and Long and Roger can actually show us how to do that in scaffold as well. But uh, ideally, what you look for in growth stocks and how to implement that in scaffold. Okay, so okay. I'll, I'll go into scaffold here while Roger. Okay, Chris, um, you, yeah, you jump to... jump into scaffold and and set up one of the uh, set up a, a search or a filter. Um, what I'll do is uh, talk about the attributes that you should be looking for um, in a company that has potential for growth. Perhaps more important than anything else is mm. just to ask a very simple question, and that is, do I think this business is going to be much bigger in five or ten years' time than it is today? Now, in answering that question, a whole bunch of new questions obviously come to the fore. Um, why do I think it's going to be bigger? What are the potential threats to this company becoming bigger? So they're really basic questions. And I'm surprised when I, when I stand in front of live audiences and I ask, how many of you, when you're thinking about buying a company, ask yourself that question? And so few hands actually go up. So few people actually ask that question. So drilling down to what we know about a business, what can we actually look at uh, today? Well, the first thing is we want a quality business. We want a business that has a sustainable competitive advantage. So that means if you're using Scaffold, for example, ideally you want it to have a, a good quality score. Now, I think the investable universe, what I regard as investment grade companies, are A1 to B3 companies. So I want A1, A2 and A3 businesses. Um, I'm interested in uh, B1, B2 and perhaps B3 businesses. I don't want anything with a four or a five in it generally. Um, and I don't want a C rated company if I can avoid it. Um, you know, I might compromise my standards if for example, I can't find anything um, in the quality space, uh, but really I'm not going to put as much capital into that as I would if it was an A1 business that was also cheap. Um, I want a business that can generate very high rates of return on equity. Um, now, that's probably the most important thing. Okay. You know, I want a business that can generate a very high rate of return on equity because what I know is if I buy and sell that company on the same PE ratio, my return for investing in that company's shares is going to approximate the retained return on equity rate. Um, so that's really valuable to me. So um, what I might do, Roger, I might yeah. go really high on that and put it at 25%. Okay. And I might be really tight on the scaffold score as well and just go A1 to B2 and let's, okay, let's just really get it tight. Yeah, narrow it down. Get a, you'll, you'll get a smaller list, of course. Um, I want a business that can retain capital. So I don't want a business, for example, 
you know, ideally I want to avoid a company like Telstra because, you know, if you look at its earnings, it hasn't grown its earnings one cent in the last 10 years. It's, it's net profit after tax, it's EBIT um, and its cash flows aren't any higher today than they were in the first half of 2006. Uh, and surprise, surprise, its share price is less than what it was 17 years ago. So, so I don't want to. I want a business that can actually retain some of its profits and generate high rates of return on incremental equity. A good way to look at that one is the historical change in value, and maybe if we just yeah. say historical change in value above zero. Yeah. So if you you want a business that's growing its intrinsic value, exactly, and a business that doesn't grow its equity uh, is is probably not going to increase its intrinsic value over time. Uh, I want a business that can manage its debt. I want to you know look. Quite frankly, a business that has a true competitive advantage can generate very high rates of return without any debt at all. It's paid it off in the past, probably doesn't have any debt now, or if it does have some debt, it's not a very high proportion compared to its equity. So its debt to equity ratio is modest. Uh, what I also want, and the, the final point is, I want a business that can grow uh, both its earnings per share and I want a business that can grow its intrinsic value. And you mentioned that a moment ago, Chris. Yeah. So they're the things I'd be looking for for a business that can actually grow. What about cash flow, Roger? Yeah, so with cash flow, we want a business that generates um, growing cash flow or we want a business that generates cash flow that's high relative to its gap reported uh, profits. Um, so, so businesses that generate uh, a high proportion of their profits as cash. Uh, you know, supermarkets, for example, do a good job of that. Uh, they, you pay them immediately uh, and uh, you pay them with a credit card or a debit card. That money goes into their account overnight or immediately. So they get the benefit of the cash that you've on a retail price straight away, but they're not paying their suppliers in some cases for 120 days. Um, now, that's a, that's a great aspect of owning a supermarket, but of course, in Australia, they're being disrupted now uh, by the likes of Aldi and potentially Lidl, the hard discounters. Uh, so they've got some good aspects in terms of cash flow, but their prospects might be diminished. So yeah, we're looking for strong cash flow as well, Chris. So a good way to track that is this cash flow ratio, and I've chosen the one that says total. So that's looking at your cash flow ratio on average over 10 years, and, and we've said um, above 0.8. So that's, that means it's at least 0.8 of or 80% of the net of the, profit after tax. Yeah, 80% yeah. of the net profit is matched by the cash flow from operations. Exactly, yeah. yep. Okay, so obviously we're looking here for growth. So the last two attributes we should zero in on are the growth um, So metrics. you want earnings per share growth, ideally? Yep. So, so yeah, we're looking for, for strong. Remember I said right at the start, we want a business that we think is going to be bigger in the future than it is today. Uh, that's ideal. There's not much point in investing if it's going to be smaller. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's Woolworths, by the way. I think it's going to be smaller in the future than it is uh, at the moment. Um, uh, so, you know, for, for what it's worth. Oh, and remember, of course, we're not telling anyone to go and buy and sell any shares. Go yeah. and seek personal professional advice. <laughs> uh, I'm just giving you my opinion. Um, uh, so, yeah, earnings per share growth. Uh, and what are you looking for there, Forecast Chris? Forecast change in value. Ultimately, as you've always said, we, we want stocks that are going to grow their intrinsic value yeah, exactly. and not go backwards or, or even stay put. Do you know, Warren Buffett said an interesting thing. He said, look, it's really, really simple. All we want is big equity and big returns on equity. That's it. We mm. want a business that can grow its equity and sustain or increase its return on equity. And that over the long run will drive stock prices. So if you're looking for businesses that are growing their intrinsic value, they've got those attributes. That's right. right. Chris, look, on the ASX, we've got about 1,826 companies. How many companies meet this very tight criteria that you and Roger have just created? Okay, well, let's hit the save button here and then all will be revealed, Shepard. Mm -hmm. So you can see on the right-hand side of the screen there, we've got 1,826 and okay. that's come all the way down to four stocks. Right. Chris, I'm interested in what sectors, because remember we mentioned trends in the beginning. What sectors are this company? We've got REA, we've got Cochlear, fisher Paykel. Yep, well, yeah. allow me just to add a couple more columns to this table and we can have a look at what sectors are represented there. So you can okay. see there's, there's quite a few in healthcare, there's quite a few in technology. Mm -hmm. Right, what I might just do, gentlemen, is um, look, we've, we've got a fair spread along um, technology and healthcare, 
Let's just pick a few and go through them. Chris, why don't you pick one and, and just go through it in Scaffold. Uh, okay. Yep. No worries. Well, I might start with Ozforex, which I've just lost sight of. There it is. Right there it is. Okay. Um, and what I'll do, I'll pull it up here on the main screen. Now, your Ozforex, for those of you who don't know, they're a business that provides foreign exchange services. Now, they commenced back in 1998 in a garage on the northern beaches of Sydney, a good start-up scenario just right there. Uh, they've now got operations in six countries and a market cap of around $500 million. Chris, it was actually a company started by a guy I used to work with at BT. Is that right? Yeah. Well-known um, Sydney business. Um, these days, well, they compete with traditional FX providers, so, you know, the likes of the banks and Western Union and and there's actually thousands of remittance providers out there. But these days they're also competing with upcoming fintech providers. So, in, for example, in the UK, you've got a company called TransferWise, uh, which already has a valuation exceeding a billion dollars. So, you know, Roger talked about disruptors. Th these guys are seen as disrupting because they're drawing people away from the banks. And they're able to do that because they can offer better rates and tighter spreads. Interesting to know. Bit Chris, about can, the I, can I give you an example of that? We pay, we pay about $300,000 a year in foreign currency invoices, so suppliers that supply data to us or our screens and so on. Um, and and we, would, we would normally spend about $3,000 through the banks transferring currency, um, you know, out of that, that amount of money. Uh, through Ausforex, it's literally a couple of hundred dollars. Yeah, well, that, that's just a beautiful example of, of how the banks are getting disrupted by this these types of business models and this one in particular. And, and the banks are caught between a rock and a hard place because they can't compete because if they compete, it damages their much larger business. Mm -hmm. So they prefer to just do nothing and see how much market share these sorts of companies can, can, uh, can grab. So there really is a good long-run uh, runway uh, for a company like Ozforex if they can grab market share, no one's really going to upset the apple cart. Yeah. So it's interesting to note, you know, since they've listed, they've fluctuated between a dollar eighty and up as far as three fifty. Now, if you look at that chart, you can see it sort of falls off a cliff back in February, and that occurred when there was a proposed takeover from Western Union, and that fell through. But since then, the price has steadily risen from a dollar eighty up to. Well, it got as high as around two thirty, but it's come back a little bit just in the last couple of weeks to two dollars eleven. Um, takeover speculation aside, the business stands pretty strong on its own merits. If we have a look at the earnings chart, you can see that the forecast earnings are heading up in a nice northeast direction, pro projected to grow at twenty eight percent per annum. Uh, and importantly, you know, we've talked about the importance of return on equity, and you can see here this blue line is your return on equity or if you look down in the table below, it's currently generating, you know, 45% forecast return on equity. Uh, other key metrics we've talked about, cash flow, uh, a very strong generator of cash. They've um, far exceeded their reported profits in terms of their cash. So the, the long-term ratio is 1.67 there. And given the size of the potential market, you know, as Roger has just mentioned, and they're expanding internationally, there's really quite a lot of room to grow, but the key will be good execution. There, It is a very competitive space, so they're going to have to stay ahead of their competitors. Awesome. Hey, Chris, uh, due to time, I might just um, cut you in and get Roger. Roger, why don't we go with uh, Fish and Vehicle? Yeah, no, look, this is a business with, with incredible growth. Uh, you can see you, know, you can see here, for example, their profit, you know, their profit after tax uh, has grown phenomenally. Um, you know, these are these are high double digit rates in a in a world that we're told will only produce low returns. Now, what this business does, it has two basic divisions, both of them related to oxygen. One is the obstructive sleep apnea market. It's in competition with ResMed. Uh, and another one is respiratory acute care. So somebody is admitted to hospital in ICU, for example, they need to be put on oxygen. Fisher and Paykel, uh, healthcare has incredible penetration in hospitals uh, in Australia. Now, what happens is um, Fisher and Paykel Healthcare sell the flow generators, the devices that are responsible for pumping the oxygen. Um, 
but they make a lot of money. In fact, a very high proportion of their revenue comes from uh, comes from the resale of the consumables, the attachments at the end of the tube that is inserted perhaps into the nasal passage or into the throat. So those consumables are becoming a, a, a growing part of the company's revenue. Um, and they had, for example, 30% growth in their respiratory acute care consumables. So that was particularly strong. In fact, we were estimating that they would only grow that by about 20%. Uh, and in fact, they grew it by uh, by 30%. And that was largely because they were able to raise prices without any detrimental impact on unit sales volume. The most valuable competitive advantage of all is, is, is for a business to be able to charge a higher price and not see any dim uh, reduction in their unit sales volume. Now, this is a business that's done incredibly well. Um, you know, the analysts are now upgrading their 2017 and 2018 earnings. Um, the business, uh, you know, has, has, you know, we love northeasterly charts uh, when in finance. You know, anything travelling in a northeasterly direction uh, is great for us. Uh, and obviously, this business is absolutely um, kicking goals. There's no doubt about that. What's interesting is that um, within the uh, obstructive sleep apnea market, the masks, which are the consumables, have grown by uh, 21%. Um, flow generators probably aren't growing as fast. In fact, they're declining slightly. Uh, but that's no problem because most of the growth for this company will actually come from the respiratory acute care, where there's not a whole lot of competition. Um, and the reason why there's not a whole lot of competition um, is because it's believed by uh, Fisher & Paykel's healthcare competitors uh, that it's not a big market uh, and really hospital providers aren't really convinced that oxygen therapy is something, humidified oxygen therapy is not, not a space where they need to be working. Um, and so they've really got, you know, a free run to grab market share. And so they're growing that very, very significantly. Penetration, as I said earlier, in hospitals is also very high. So now the focus for the company is basically increasing patient usage within that very high penetration uh, in hospitals. What I like about this business um, is that their return on equity has been maintained at very high double digit rates, even though they've tripled equity over the last uh, the last uh, 10 years. Um, management is now guiding revenue of $900 million and uh, NPAT of $165 to $170 million, uh, which is again, solid double digit rates of growth. Um, the price is very expensive today, uh, or it looks expensive today. Um, but let me say this, um, sometimes for a business that you believe might be double the size, and this is a business where it's penetration of consumables uh, in the respiratory acute care um, uh, is, is only about 2 million patients being serviced uh, at the moment, or if you like, 2 million patient services. And they think the addressable market is 30 million patients. So it's 15 times bigger than what they're currently servicing. So sometimes if you believe that the growth is going to be 20 or 30% a year, you can, with a small amount of capital, sometimes afford to pay a higher price. And any pullback obviously would make this company even more attractive. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's Fisher and Paykel Healthcare. All right, look, let's quickly switch back to that list uh, and see if we can pick another ticker for you to go through, Chris. Sure, Shepard. There we go. Apen. Okay, so I'll talk about Apen. Um, uh, quick disclosure, I do own Apen and I do also own Osphorex. It's a technology company based in Sydney. They've got operations in the US and the Philippines. Uh, revenue grew from 51 to 81 million in uh, FY15. And a lot of their revenues repeat revenue coming from existing customers, so new projects, but with existing customers. I thought it's interesting to note, this is a slide from their presentation. You can see there that the business is basically divided up into two divisions. One is search technology. And, and what that means is they support e-commerce vendors. So if you go to a, a site and you're interested in buying a particular product and you type in that you're interested in buying shoes, um, they are providing the technology to a lot of these sites to help bring bring up the best results for, for those products. They also are helping social media companies to deliver relevant content. And you can see at the, the right side of that chart that their revenue in that content relevance search-based business has 
uh, well, almost doubled there. And uh, likewise, with operating profit, it's almost doubled. So, so Chris, would it be right? Am I, I mean, this is a new company for me. I, I don't know anything about this business. So they're optimising search for merchants. Is that, is that, that correct? That, yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, um, okay. And also doing stuff in the social media space, um, helping in, in that sort of content relevant search stuff. Okay. The other side to their business is what, what says language resources there. So that's um, speech recognition, basically. So Microsoft is a very large client of theirs, and they helped build um, Skype Translator. So Skype Translator was a project whereby if I'm speaking into Skype in English and my friend only speaks Spanish, uh, Skype will in real time translate what I'm saying into Spanish, and then they'll speak back in Spanish and Skype will translate it into English and I'll hear it in English. Um, so they're working on uh, projects like that, which are really quite cutting edge, as well as um, speech recognition in cars. They do a lot of work with uh, automobile manufacturers and voice acted commands on gaming consoles. And again, you can see looking at that chart that they've grown uh, really strongly in, in the language resource section as well. All right. I gather you, you wanted to jump in there, Shepard. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, let's have a quick look at uh, the return on equity and, and this capital score. And yeah, okay. So let's look at some of those key factors. Um, I'll just jump straight up to the capital history screen here. So you can see the return on equity is in the 30s, which is a you know nice, healthy number, a very healthy number. And they've got no debt. So a you know, good, strong balance sheet. And that's translated into a scaffold score of A1, which is as good as it gets. Uh, cash flow, again, a key metric that we like to talk about, fluctuates a bit, but overall it's been very strong. It is a short history, though. It is. It yeah. is a short history, and, yeah. and that's, a, that's a good point to note. They only listed uh, the beginning of last year. at uh, uh, So they raised $15 million at 50 cents. They have gone ballistic, um, and they're currently $2.38. So, you know, looking at the valuation, it's getting pretty toppy, but, you know, clearly a, a business that's been growing very strongly. All right, Chris, well, look, uh, because of time, I might just get ready to cover one more um, from that list. Uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we look at uh, Altium? Altium. So... Okay, terrific. So Altium, uh, for, for those of those of you who uh, don't know, uh, is is an amazing Australian business. Um, it designs the software that uh, electrical engineers use to design printed circuit boards. Now I'm looking at our desk here. We've got a computer, we've got a laptop, we've got a couple of mobile phones. There's a telephone over there. Um, you might have a digital watch. There's a keyboard. There's a mouse. Uh, every one of those devices, a digital microphone, every one of those devices has in it a printed circuit board. Now you think globally about the proliferation of electronic devices, um, every one of those needs a printed circuit board and Altium has in, in, in a number of years uh, grown to now uh, command about 10% of the software market in this particular space. So its market share is already 10%. Um, its revenue streams are twofold. Um, the Altium Designer version 15 software, which is about 35% uh, of their revenue, um, they sell that on a perpetual license. So you buy it for $7,500 um, and that's US dollars. Uh, and then they also have a subscription service. So if you want to keep your updates going, there's about three updates a year, um, then you pay an additional about $1,750 US dollars a year, um, and that's about 47% of their revenue. So what we're, why would you, why do you care so much, why do we care so much about this business? One is we know there's, you know, the whole internet of things trend, the whole digitization of, of products, the connection of products means that printed circuit boards will become more complicated. And these guys have a team of programmers who are writing millions and millions of lines of code in order to put every new faster chip that's, uh, that, that, that the printed circuit board requires, um, they've got to put lines and lines of code into the software. So no one's really interested in competing with them on that because it's not a very big market. 
Um, it doesn't generate, it generates about $850 million of revenue globally uh, at the moment. So no one really wants to build a business in competition with them because in order to start today, you would have to backdate every device and that would require three to five years of programming with hundreds of programmers um, typing millions and millions, if not billions of lines of code. Um, so it's more likely that someone's going to come along and buy a business if they want to enter this market rather than start from scratch. So the company has a clear runway uh, ahead. Their customers are absolutely big name customers right around the world. And I've got a few names there, you know, from ResMed and BMW and Boeing to Audi and Chrysler and Bose, pretty much, you know, any major company that has an electronic device, uh, even Lexmark, the printing company, um, they use this company software. You're not going to switch once you've, once you've embedded your, your systems and processes in the um, Altium language. Uh, if you want to retrain your your electronic engineers uh, uh, into in another language, another code or another product, you're going to lose about two to three months of productivity. So it's unlikely you're going to want to do that. Um, if they lose customers, it's going to be very slow and we're going to be able to see that. At the moment, they're winning customers, raising prices. And so we think they're, uh, they're an incredible business. And um, yeah, lots of growth ahead. All right, great. Look, we're almost out of time, but what I'd like to do is um, just quickly come back to the list. And I want to try and get all our attendees to, to chime in here. Now, have a quick look at that list. What I want us to do is to quickly vote for a stock that uh, would like Roger and Chris to quickly just drill down into and, and talk about. There's a few that I know are of interest. We've got Blackmores. Uh, we've seen Blackmores all over the news um, with, with all the Chinese or Asian buyers buying it through. We've got m and that's another one of interest, communication services, and we also have Technology One. Now, you know, why don't you gentlemen just, uh, in about two minutes or so, just go through each one of those. Uh, right yeah, I'm, I'm, do you want me to go first, Chris? I feel so, like, yeah. So Blackmore's obviously, its share price rallied enormously on the back of what I think was a fad, um, and and that was, and it became a fad. This, this, fads have an element of, of legitimacy to them at the beginning. The idea that um, a Chinese parent wants the best quality infant formula uh, or vitamins for themselves or their child uh, and, uh, and they don't trust the Chinese manufacturing process. Uh, and so we saw Blackmore's products run off the shelf uh, in Australia uh, and people were buying them through the grey market, packaging them up in Australia, buying them at retail prices and selling them for many, many multiples in China. The companies obviously got wind of this and they so they set up websites and they set up distribution channels in China. What happened, of course, was that that's all valid. That's all a great story. But the share prices got well ahead, much like the mining boom, mm -hmm. when everyone said that China was going to grow at double digit rates for the next 100 years. You know, they project recent experience out forever. And they thought the same thing was going to happen with Blackmores. It's a solid company. It's got a rep great reputation. It's got a great range of products. It's just moving into the infant formula space. But recently they launched it and I think they only sold something like 50, it was reported in the Financial Review in their first week after launch, they only sold 56 tins um, of their, their infant formula. And so as a result, we've seen the, the enthusiasm pull back somewhat. You know, this is the sort of company that you will get the opportunity eventually to buy, I think, at a discount to its intrinsic value. And when that happens, you can assess it then. You don't want to take part in a fad um, or a bubble. And, uh, and when the price of Blackmores and some of the others like Bellamy's and A2 Milk and Capilano Honey, when they're at their all-time highs, it really was a bubble. It really was. You're paying mm -hmm. three or 400 times earnings for those things, and that's just silly. All right. Chris, uh, do you want to just quickly cover Technology One quickly as well? Sure, Shepard, no problem. Um, so Technology One, as the name suggests, it's a technology business. What they do is they develop enterprise software. Now, it's really interesting to note with Technology One, they've had 12 consecutive years of record profits, uh, sorry, record revenue, and they invest really heavily in R&D. So 22% of their revenue is going into R&D. So you can see, looking at the earnings chart here, that they've uh, grown their earnings every year since 2009, and they're forecast to continue doing so. Profits forecast to grow at 15% in 2016. 
And interestingly, they've jumped onto one of the, the, the current major trends, which is cloud services revenue, and their cloud services revenue has doubled in, in the last year. They've also continuously paid a dividend since listing in 1999. So that's a, a reflection of the fact that they're um, a consistent performer. Uh, I guess getting back to the old value versus price, they have run pretty hard. They are quite expensive at the moment, both looking at uh, the safety margin and also looking at the PE ratio. They're trading on a PE ratio of just under 40. But uh, yeah, obviously a, a well-run business um, at, and at the right price could potentially be a good investment. All right, awesome. Well, look, gentlemen, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, so I'll just uh, get back to the list. So our growth stock list uh, had REA, PRW Holdings, Blackmores, Certex, MNF Group, Integrated Research, APEN, Northern Star, Ozforex, Cochlear, Fish and Paco, Technology One, RTM and Class. Investing in shares can be rewarding when you do your research, but it can also take up a lot of your time. With so much information out there, how do you quickly sort through the companies worth investing in and those to steer clear of? Scaffold is my research tool of choice. It tracks and reports on all ASX listed companies, plus thousands of global stocks daily, helping me decide which stocks to buy and sell. I can quickly filter through the reports to get the information I need. The rating system is like a set of traffic lights for the stock market. Green is good, orange is caution and red is don't go any further. Scaffold's top stock choices have been highlighted for their outstanding performance by Money Magazine. With Scaffold doing the work for me, I have the confidence to make investment decisions without having to spend hours sifting through financial data. Now you can take control of your time and your portfolio. Why not take Scaffold for a test drive today?